Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Uninformed Movie Reviews. We are here, and we're here with another installment of our quest to find out what our favorite movie of all time is, at least up until this point. Obviously, we will see other movies that haven't come out yet, or movies that have come out, and we just haven't seen. And today, since, uh, you know, Fourth of July is coming up, we decided to do most American movies. Movie- Q Eagle. Q Eagle, yeah. <laughs> Ooh, you can have a really bad after effect just swooping across the screen. Yeah, I can definitely do all that. And uh, <laughs> the patriotism is going to be high, so expect some chanting of USA. Might, oh, might go down. Although we're on a Zoom call, so it's going to be really hard to like line I, those USAs up. Chants are never like 100% on point, you know? That's fine. At least not for the first three or so. Mm-hmm. So if you've never seen Movie Quest before or experienced one of these episodes, we each have a runner-up. And a favorite, and Frank, what's your runner-up for? Wait, really quick to Ooh. to explain for people other than myself, can you tell me what a runner-up is? Oh, a runner-up traditionally is second place. Although I, I guess maybe in a two-man race, do they still call it runner-up? I don't know. You know, nah, that guy's just the loser. I think that guy's just a loser. Yeah. And speaking of losers, Frank, what do you have for your runner-up? Thank you for the segue, David. Uh, <laughs> for my runner-up pick. My favorite, mo- my second favorite, most American. Uh-oh. <laughs> when I have 2006, says idiocracy from Mike Judge. Oh. Ooh. now that's a hot take. Yes, I'll you know it that. is a hot take, but um, I just want to preface this with like it's a satire. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and that's kind of the beauty of this film. It like highlights our worst attributes like as a people like our biggest like shameful gluttonous selves and uh at the same time it's like an american tale of like this loser who picks himself up by the bootstraps and ends up being one of the most powerful men in the world um and it's a beautiful story for those of you unfamiliar with idiocracy um it follows luke wilson that's owen wilson's brother for those of you who didn't know also, you're an idiot. Um, <laughs> plays a uh, he's described in the movie as remarkably extremely average. He's this uh, private in the army who's just like in every category that they have, he is just like in the middle, just highly, highly average, the most average person. They decide they're going to cryogenically freeze him for a year as part of this experiment to see if it's possible to store human beings forever. Uh, they pick him. And this sex worker, Rita, um, and the whole Rita thing is really funny at the beginning of the movie. Um, Officer Collins is the name of the, the uh, like army scientist who's running the experiment. He's going through this slideshow, like telling everybody how it's going to go down. And he's like, yeah, and we had to like make an offer to Rita's pimp. Um, God, what's his name? I have it written down here. Uh, upgrade. Um, mm-hmm. And it's spelled uh, U P G R A Y E D D for that double dose of pimping. Um, and that's a quote, um, but they, he, he's going through the slideshow and he's like, yeah, and we had to like get in with him and like earn his trust so that he would make the deal with us. And he starts talking about like how the pimp game is hard and everything. And you can tell he's like really getting into it. And it's like 12 shots of this guy, like in strip clubs, like with the pimp and his pimp friends. Uh, it's really good. There's a whole gag that comes back. The whole reason everything goes awry is because less than a year into them being frozen, um, Officer Collins gets busted for a uh, prostitution ring that he is now in with Upgrade. (laughs) Uh, So the whole thing gets forgotten about, goes into a trash pile, and they wake up in the year uh, 2505, uh, 500 years later, and the world has degraded into... um, it's like everybody with terrible IQs because dumb people uh, reproduce more than like highly intelligent people. As is just a fact. As something that happens. Uh, um, but it does just, take a lot of brains to reproduce. This movie shows that. No, it really doesn't. Um, but everybody's an idiot. One of my favorite things about they describe about the new world is uh, that the English language has degraded into a hybrid of hillbilly, valley girl, and inner city slang, as well as various grunts. Um, and it comes, everybody refers to each other as like Vato. It, it's just a fun world, man. <laughs> what's uh, uh, what's um, t- uh, Terry Cruz's name? Camacho. Camacho. I actually have his full name. I made sure to catch this time. <laughs> his name is President Dwayne Alessandro Mountain Dew Herbert Camacho. Uh, 
current president of the United States. He's a five-time Ultimate SmackDown champion and a porn superstar. <laughs> <laughs> Whoo, man, this is less into the realms of being like extravagant now. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, and I, I thought it was funny, like, uh, Trump is our most Camacho president so far. He's like a tiny modicum of Camacho, but he's the one who's gotten the closest. Um, but it, it's really funny, um, just subtle differences in the world, like everybody, nobody calls it the economy anymore, everybody says a comedy, um, and that runs throughout the whole movie, it's really funny. Uh, I always love the part that's like, water? You mean that stuff that's in the toilets? Yeah. Why would you drink that? <laughs> <laughs> the whole main problem in this world is like there's famine and drought and there's dust bowl because they have switched from using water in almost everything to using like Brondo, which is like this Gatorade power of the Gator TM. Um, uh, we're going to need a demonstration on that. Yep. There we go. Mm -hmm. There it is. Classic. Um, but they're using this to like water the crops. Like they give it to babies. Like they use Brondo mm. for everything. Water, water fountains. Um, why do they use it, Frank? Because it's got what plants crave. <laughs> Brando's made with electrolytes. It's got electrolytes. Uh, but obviously electrolytes are salt. So like it, it's just like they're pouring salt into the topsoil and it killed all the plants. Um, so the whole movie is just him being like this super average dude. But throughout the events of the movie of like uh, he gets arrested because he doesn't. Everybody has like a barcode ID on their wrist that acts like their ID and their debit card and everything. Um and he's like unscannable. They like throw him in jail, give him an IQ test so they can give him a jail job. And they realize, oh my God, this guy's the smartest guy in the world. And they make him the secretary of the interior. <laughs> 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 um, and he just fixes things because he's like not a total complete moron. Um, super awesome comedy. Um, not very dramatic. It's just like a lighthearted, silly movie. Tons of good laughs. Uh, I actually did my rewatch to this movie today. Had a fantastic time. 10 out of 10, highly recommend. <laughs> Another fantastic Mike Judge movie. Yeah, what can mm. you, how can you go wrong with Mike Judge? It's funny how it's like Mike Judge, it's funny the movie like focuses around like a super average dude and they got an average dude to portray the average dude and they got a pretty average dude to make the film. Yeah. <laughs> um, he has a solid supporting cast, though, which I think really helps out. Obviously, Terry Crews, like we mentioned, brings the heat. So funny that everybody who plays in the cabinet, I forget everybody's names, but that everybody in the cabinet does a great Dax job. Dax Shepard is in it. Yeah, right? Dax Shepard mm -hmm. is his lawyer uh, who gets a ton of screens time, as well as uh, Maya Rudolph, who is hilarious, who plays Rita, the prostitute. <laughs> this is also. I think the first time that a movie quest movie has made two appearances, Frank. Boom, two. I meant to make a big deal about it at the beginning, but I forgot because I was trying to build suspense. <laughs> I, I will definitely say this movie was in my running for sure because I had recently done a rewatch and it's just it holds up so well. In yeah. fact, it's a, it's a lot like when we the experience we had when we watched Contagion, where it was like <laughs> where it just gets more relevant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully a little bit different, right? I um, I still haven't seen um, uh, Idiocracy, and I hadn't seen it last episode either. <laughs> That's surprising. <laughs> That's yeah, I need to go around to it. Update, you know. Um, one of the things I've really, just a couple of other things I want to point out in the movie that like have to be shouted out because they're so hilarious. Um, they go, they're trying to find a time machine, so they go to like the Costco. Uh, Dax Shepard's character is like, yeah, I love Costco. Like, I went to law school here, and apparently, like. A, <laughs> You're walking into this huge place. The greeter at the front hits you with a "Welcome to Costco. I love you." Makes me laugh. <laughs> no good. Um, the whole world has become this like derelict world. Everything's all run down. They just pile trash everywhere. Um, and there's a lot of changes in a lot of stores you would have normally recognize, but they look a little weird now. Like the adult tax returns place, um, the adult chicken place, and then uh, at Starbucks. Um, it's, it's basically like a rub and tug, but they also have lattes for $2. So that's, cool. <laughs> uh, there, there's a really funny scene when they're like walking, they're trying to find the Costco. Um, Joe mentions, man, I could really go for a Starbucks right now. And Dak Shepard, his lawyer turns around and goes, wow, Joe, I hardly think we have time for a hand job. <laughs> <laughs> He's just there like, what? 
Uh, <laughs> House of Representatives is no longer the House of Representatives. It's the House of Representing, because um, it'd be like that, you know. Uh, and it's just it's just full of like really good little gags like that throughout the entire movie. Lots of silliness. <laughs> The like whole Carl's Jr. thing, one of the cabinet members, he has like a sponsorship with Carl's Jr. So at the end of every sentence, he says, brought to you by Carl's Jr. <laughs> <laughs> Don't they have a kid in the cabinet too? Yeah, he like that. won a contest, so he got to be a cabinet member. <laughs> it's like a little bit of Willy Wonka in there. Yeah, yeah. Really funny stuff. That's good. That's good. Okay, well. It's a definite 10 out of 10. I said it last time. I'll say it again. I'll have to check it out soon. <laughs> Check it out. If I bring this movie up one more time in this podcast and you haven't watched it yet, oh boy, David. Then you'll have to be penalized by watching one Pixar movie with it. No, I just won't do it. (laughs) Most inspirational movie with the happiest ending and make you sit down and watch it, David. I mean, I don't know how many times we've referenced Frank not seeing Inception, and that still hasn't happened. So I I think that's quite fair. Understand. Also has to happen. (laughs) Frank, you'll have to sit down and watch Air Bud also. Oh, down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wait, Frank hasn't seen Air Bud? It plays basketball, bro. <laughs> Ugh. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant Golden Receiver, not the basketball one. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the line is drawn. That movie's never need sequels. Bro. That's a very American thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like Land Before Time 8. Yes. <laughs> um well danny did you want to go next what what do you want to do uh yeah i guess i will start with my er are you in an runner up um <laughs> which would be my second yes uh, <laughs> so guys i had to choose on this one it was between another film that i dearly love but it's jaws jaws is what you have... picked yes oh, jaws okay. is a very american movie <laughs> Just out of curiosity, what was third place? <laughs> Jurassic Park. Ooh, yeah. Hmm. Right. Those are good yeah. creature. You know, yeah, it's got the creature thing, but it's also, you know, when you think of blockbusters and American movie blockbusters, it's like Jurassic Park and Jaws are, you know, almost synonymous with the word blockbuster. But I chose, I went with Jaws because it is actually probably one of the first examples of a real blockbuster, a summer blockbuster. Yeah. Not only that, Jaws also contextually takes place over Fourth of July weekend. Ooh, bow, 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 bow. that's it, a good point. They made a movie about a shark ruining the beaches so well that it actually ruined the beaches. <laughs> <laughs> like right. up that, the whole like beach tourism economy. Even but. it even made people scared to swim in their own swimming pools in yeah. their house. So yeah. yeah. Being a little kid and being afraid to like be in the swimming at night when I couldn't see the bottom. <laughs> exactly. That sounds straight irrational. <laughs> but that's being a little kid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm sure like even back then, because there was no precedent for a shark movie, it's pretty incredible how like influential this movie. I mean, it sparked a whole genre. Hmm. Without Jaws, we wouldn't have never gotten Sharknado. You know, had Sharknado. I just have to, the only, I mean, the only other instance, arguably just as impactful as Jaws is the zombie shark fight scene from zombie, the movie. I mean, everyone talks about Jaws and the zombie shark fight scene. Like they're almost the same. You know what I mean? So that's a tough one, but. That's a tough yeah, thing. You know, that's right here in the streets all the time, David. Every yeah. time I'm by a group of kids, they're like, I don't know that. <laughs> that scene from zombies. It's pretty impactful. I mean, it's a real shark. That's the crazy part. They just put a real shark in the water with a person. That's just, that's a bad, you can't get away with that idea nowadays. A shark do what it's going to do and it's going to do shark things, you know? Probably cheaper than making an animatronic shark. <laughs> um, I, I love Jaws uh, and we, I, don't, I edited in a little reference too, but I just love how accurate it is that people just complain when people are trying to like enforce public safety. Like, hey, everyone. Someone got killed by the shark in the water. We have a we have a specialist here, a shark specialist, who's telling us it's not safe. Everybody's like, "Oh, we we can't be closed Fourth of July weekend." It's Fourth of July weekend. It's a tradition. <laughs> I have a right to be on the beach. It's infringing on our beach rights. Yeah, this uh, is Steven Spielberg's second film, y'all. 
Hmm. Not only that, the studio, I mean, was super stoked with him after his first release, but also he went 300% over budget. With Ooh, this movie. He was terrified he would never get work again if it didn't do well, which he probably wouldn't have. Yeah, the shooting was- schedule, <laughs> right? The shooting schedule was originally 55 days. It ended up turning into 159 days of shooting. And he spent $12 million on this, which back then in 1975 is ridiculous. Probably more akin to like $200 million on it. Yeah. yeah Ooh. Man, 1975 too. You know what? I got to apologize, everyone. I'm pretty sure that shark zombie scene is after Jaws. If anything, we have Jaws to thank. <laughs> For the Maybe. glory that is zombie versus shark in the movie zombie. Spreading misinformation. Oops. Hey, I corrected you it. I only watched the first couple of minutes of this and they tuned out before you could redact your ridiculous statement. <laughs> well, we're like 20 minutes in, Frank. You're losing your concept of time in quarantine. Um, <laughs> but uh, what's it called? The, the one thing I like about Jaws that I think is so original about that movie is the pacing. It's like mm-hmm. almost exactly two hours long. And it's like an hour is is them on the beach scrambling, like trying to figure out what the plan is. And then the last hour is just on the boat. Yeah, it's the fight. Yeah, and the fight is so little of that time. You know what I mean? There's so much isolation there. There's some good character development stuff. And yeah, then just amazing. Great, great tension building all the way to the end. Um, and then, of course, you know, you got to shout out John Williams every time he shows up. John Williams, Roy Scheider. Uh, Richard Dreyfuss is in it. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people. And then it just like sparked a whole mythology about Jaws too, which obviously got much more diluted <laughs> afterwards. But oh, the whole uh the whole thing of Jaws and then that that like missing girl, uh, that like the that unsolved murder case where she ended up being like in the background of a Jaws scene. That's right. Whoa. So- to this day but they're the people have like tried to piece it together like how this girl showed up dead like she was in the background i was seeing a jaws one day and she was just dead on the beach the next that's insane maybe it was a shark i don't know land sharks you gotta watch out for them <laughs> land sharks y'all <laughs> um, <laughs> beer. I, I was um man I, I i just lost my train of thought a little bit I, I was gonna say something else about jaws hmm well, it's gone. It's gone and it'll never come back. But you know what? That's life. As it happens. Yeah. So that's my runner up, fellas. I actually have a little, uh, like a tiny little sketch that you did offhand while I was working on a tattoo one time of uh, the sheriff from Jaws, the cigarette. Oh, well. uh, that's right. We're going to need a bigger boat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what I was going to say now. How many of the Jaws movies have you guys seen? Oh, I've seen four, I think. Two. I think there are four of them. I I've seen really... Jaws 3D and yeah, Jaws the Revenge. Dumb. I think it's Jaws 4 where, like, it's, like, the shark's descendant, obviously, because the other sharks die. Um, but the shark is, like, carrying revenge for the Brody children. Like, the shark knows it's going after the Brody kids. I think it's the fourth one. Is that Jaws the Revenge? I think Jaws the Revenge is the fourth one, right? I'm pretty sure that's it. Because there's only four of them, but it's either the third one or the fourth one. But there's one of them where there's like a sentient shark who's purposefully hunting for Brody's children because he can somehow (laughs) identify them. Um, But The third one. I'm pretty sure the third one takes place in like a SeaWorld knockoff. Something like that, yeah. I don't know. What do you call it when a shark movie jumps the shark? Like, how does that work? <laughs> Jump the fawns. <laughs> Jump the fawns? <laughs> it's just fawns treading water. <laughs> um, all right, well, let me get to my runner-up then. Um, for my runner-up, everybody, and you know what? Give me one second, because I didn't get the year here, which is quite embarrassing, but I do have the Internet Movie Database pulled up here. Come on, David. Can I get a year here? 2005s. Directed by Jason Reitman. Thank you for smoking. This was my runner-up. Wow. That's and a man, choice. I considered for a moment, David. I, I went through so many movies, guys. I was telling Frank a little bit about this earlier. Like, First, I was like, well, maybe Star Wars, because it's just so culturally impactful. Or maybe Indiana Jones. I almost picked Air Force One. And I, was t- <laughs> I watched like 20 minutes of American History X today, like thinking... I'm picking American History X. And then I was like, you know what? This is too bleak. It's pretty intense. It's pretty intense. And it's not really about America. 
Yeah. Um, but thank you for smoking. Uh, in case you're not familiar with it. So this is directed by Jason Reitman, son of Ivan Reitman. Very famous for the Ghostbusters films. I don't know if you guys have heard of these. Um, only the first two in the Ghostbusters trilogy, though, just so we're all clear about about which ones he's done. Yeah, you don't want to throw accidentally throw shade on a director who's done a fantastic job by lumping him in with some <laughs> garbage. Um, this is a novel based... Uh, the novel is written by Christopher Buckley, who, uh, to be honest, I'm not very familiar with, but he'll come... He's of importance to this little tale here. So Thank You for Smoking is a movie about um, Aaron Eckhart, who plays a lobbyist for Big Tobacco. And what is a lobbyist? Well, I guess a lobbyist is the, the speaking arm of a corporation or special interest. And in this case, he is the lobbyist for Big Tobacco, who he represents. Um, and he has some friends, one who is the lobbyist for uh, alcohol, like the alcohol association or whatever they call it in here. And then also one for the like knockoff NRA. And it's by, ah, man, I always forget his name. It's by Packard, uh, uh, Jack Packard. Pac-Man? Or Todd Packard. It said Jack Todd Packard. Todd Packard? Oh, uh, David Ketch. David, uh, David Ketchner. Ketchner, that's it. Yeah. Um, man, I love that guy. That guy just I comes up in, in so many great roles. He always plays dry so well. Um, and he's usually just a total jerk about it. And he's uh, he's like in the faux NRA. And one of the funniest things is like in one of the first scenes, they're just sitting around the table. And they, they just um, – they try to make strategy, like how can we deceive the American public and, and what lies can we use to, to get away? And, and they have David Koechner going on this whole thing about like, well, if you're in a car crash, do you sue Ford about it? And I was like, oh my God, is this the origin of this faux argument that's on the internet, <laughs> even in 2020? Yeah, that argument had to exist before. I would, I mean, I would think so, right? But it's it's funny to see them talk about these hot button issues in this movie because this movie's 2005 it's not that old the book is is older um and this is something they've been trying to make since like the 90s but basically they didn't like any of the screenplays people had come up with until little reitman came along um but it's funny because i feel like tobacco's not even a problem anymore like tobacco's not even a thing people are upset about it because cigarette sales have just gone down so much no, no, that's not 100% true because everybody was losing their minds on vapes like at the beginning of this year or like the end of last year. Well, before. that's what I'm saying. Yeah, vapes. Yeah, it's moved to vapes. It's yeah. moved to vapes because it's something different. Tobacco. It's well, nicotine. they have nicotine. It's not tobacco. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but that's how you regulate it. Like it's still like a tobacco thing. A tobacco product, yeah. Oh, I guess that's true. But I would argue, I mean, I, they're just not the same corporations though, are they? It's not like oh. more. It's like not like Marlboro them. has a vape out right now. Like at the gas station is owned by the people who mm, own. That's interesting. Well, I mean, either way, though, I, I just feel like we haven't seen like an anti-smoking campaign in a long time. We, we yeah. haven't seen like someone melting into a couch. Although I guess that's more of a drug one than a tobacco one. Like really, any of those truth commercials, really. Or maybe YouTube just doesn't give it to me because I'm not the right age range. You know what I mean? Oh. Uh, you're a lost cause. <laughs> yeah, we might have just aged out of it, which, you know. Oh, the truth commercials? Thank God. They still come on. They're on day TV for sure. Like the uh, don't always die from tobacco cowboy uh, with the, through the little machine. Don't always die from tobacco. That's right. <laughs> That's I forgot song. about that. <laughs> a hole in her neck. Woo. Yeah. Just like volcano. Um, just like volcano. Or is that Dante's Peak? Man. It always I happens. think it's Dante's Peak. Those two, I really have a hard time like keeping separate in my mind. Well, they're definitely going to be coming up on a later discussion. Next cool. episode, everyone. Plug. Um, well, just a quick summary in case you, someone hasn't seen this. You both have seen this movie, I'm assuming, right? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Okay, I, believe yeah. watched I this rented it from Redbox. Oh, when Redbox. I, when it came out. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's a long time ago now. What were you saying, Frank? <laughs> I, I think it cut out a little bit. I think you and I have seen it together like oh. one occasion. I wouldn't be surprised. I think it came up in conversation and we were like, yes, let's watch it. <laughs> It's been a bit for me too. This this one it had been a few years since I had seen it last, so it was well, cool like, to. 
Oh, sorry. If my memory serves me correct, it was like at Wallington. Like it was that long ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I gotta say though, uh, comedic wise, it still holds up. It's it's there's some really off the wall performances, like um, Adam Brody. He just has these like bizarre lines that were so weird back then that they're still like funny now. There's not a lot of like dated humor. Like coming out of like watching Forty Year Old Virgin a, a couple weeks ago, and then comparing a movie from a similar time period. I'm like, wow, this movie like really, it doesn't feel so grounded in one time period like some other comedies do, which was cool. It's a really um, intelligently written film, I feel like. You know what I mean? Much like something like that came around the same year, like Burn After Reading or something, you know? Yeah. And I think it's funny, too, because in the movie, it's supposed to be like him being a great talker who's able So, But at the same time, when you have a character like that, you have to have clever writing so that it's believable. You know what I mean? Um, and I think they really nail that. Um, but basically, Aaron Eckhart, he's, he's his lobbyist, right? Um, and he's representing Big Tobacco. And there's a few little things going on in the movie, like little subplots. Um, Tom Cruise's ex-wife. What's her name again? I always forget her name. Katie, Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes. Katie Holmes is Don't like worry, a, we all forgot about her too. <laughs> she's like an investigative reporter writing an article on him. And she's also sleeping with him to get more information from him. But he doesn't know this right away because he's an idiot. And then he has like little relationship issues with his son. Um, his wife is divorced from him. His wife is uh, Kim Coates. I'm pretty sure her name is. She's from um, Deadwood and she's in Fear the Walking Dead. She's like the mom in Fear oh, the Walking Dead. Yeah. Um, it's funny to see her like so much younger. I almost didn't recognize her. Um, but anyways, he's trying to bond with his son and also like encourage his son through showing him like what life is like. I'm such an all-star. I'm so good at speaking and everything. Uh, there's a few other subplots like Rob Lowe's there. They're trying to get like a movie to pass with cigarettes. Um, that really old guy. And I always forget his name too, man. I'm, I feel like I'm a ranch on Netflix. Oh, uh, Sam Elliott. Yeah. Yeah. Sam Elliott is the Marlboro man. He's actually like the equivalent. He of actually that. is the Marlboro man. Yeah. He's like that guy that Frank's talking about in that commercial. Uh, Kim Dickens is the actress you were thinking of. Kim Dickens, man. Kim I, Coates is the guy that plays Tig in uh, <laughs> SOA. That's so funny. Wrong gender, same name. Um, man, Robert Duvall. There we go. Oh, uh, I love me some Robert Duvall. Yeah, he's the uh, he's the captain of the smoking. Uh, you know the the board of I forget what they call it, the American Smoking Science Association or something like that. Um, but I mean, there's just great performances too. And of course, J.K. Simmons, uh, who is Aaron Eckhart's boss. I mean, J.K. Simmons is always solid. He's one of my favorite actors. Um, and I, commercials that dude's knocking it out of the park. You know what I mean? Right. And and he goes on to be in another movie from Jason Reitman. He's in Juno. He's like Juno's dad. Um, and he's also great in that movie too. And he's got such a warmer role than he usually does. He's usually just like, just a jerk. <laughs> Just super stern. I want pictures of Spider Man. That's all. That's <laughs> all he usually is. Um, but man, he, uh, watching the movie again, I thought it was really good. I saw this movie in high school, and I remember in high school rooting so much more for Aaron Eckhart because the real villain in the movie is William H Macy, who's like a senator from Wisconsin or something, or from Vermont, and oh, it's from Vermont, and. William H. Macy is trying to pass this law to put skull and crossbones on cigarettes. And Aaron Eckhart's just trying to do, you know, his sly con man scheme to get out of there. But watching the movie now, it's like, oh, this is just corporations like trying to control the American public. Um, And here are a bunch of like, and, and they even joke about it in the movie. Like Aaron Eckhart calls out William H. Macy saying like, Oh, so I guess any of your campaign contributions have swayed your your uh, your pull, your decision at all. And he's like, what? Uh, no. Um, it's so funny. Um, and when I finished watching the movie, I was like, this is interesting because there's no hero here. It's like Aaron Eckhart's a scumbag, but he's witty. And William H. Macy is like devious and uh, and trying to uh, – He's just like pack money. Un- yeah, and he's totally underhanded. So who's the winner here? There's no winner. It's, not, it's like corporation versus government. Man, real losers am- america in that situation <laughs> exactly i was like man what an american tale here um, you know who the are? they're the uh the activists who kidnap aaron eckhart <laughs> and, uh, put a bunch of nicotine patches all over him and he can never smoke again because he'll die and it kind of changes things for him i mean if you had to pick a hero yeah. those 
those in the van. That's true. I mean, if anything, they, I mean, maybe are the most just people, but the part that really cracked me up. So the what? I'm sorry. I said, but that's also kidnapping. So yeah, that's, it's like they were trying to murder him. (laughs) They failed, but still probably not a good idea. Um, when I finished watching the movie in the DVD extras, they had a clip from the Charlie Rose show from when this movie came out. And they had like uh, Jason Reitman there, Aaron Eckhart there. And it was funny because Aaron Eckhart had just finished filming Dark Knight Rises or Dark Knight. And they were making a joke. He was like, yeah, I'm in this other movie right now that's coming out. It's, you know, it's just a little movie that I'm working on or whatever. <laughs> like, like that. Dark, I mean, I guess they didn't know how big Dark Knight was going to be, but still it's like, man, you knew you were in Batman. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, Christopher Buckley's there too. The, the, the writer of the novel and they're chatting and he's talking about how he felt like Jason Reitman had finally gotten the script, right. They've been trying to do this thing since the nineties and they weren't happy with any of any of the adaptations that had come up and a bunch of people were interested in doing this movie um but then it just turns out that christopher buckley is like this super hardcore libertarian Ah. and like in like in him writing the book it is supposed to be aaron eckhart being the hero he's like independent um you know american americans should have their own right to kill themselves if they want the government can't tell us what to do but like it's hilarious because they don't realize how they're painting Aaron Eckhart in this whole story. But it's like, this guy is just so into it in this Charlie Rose interview. I bet Um, him and Dan Crenshaw would be good friends. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's just what I was thinking. It just feels so funny, but at the same time, it also strengthened my pick. Cause I was like, man, we're talking all the time about comedies not aging well. And this somehow feels very contemporary. When you watch it, you're like, man, this seems like nothing has changed in 15 years which is probably true because it has yeah because it hasn't it's exactly what's happened my friend (laughs) so yeah maybe not a positive image of america but my choice for runner-up and with that i pass it to frank it's a very literal image of america with the good good job david thank you nice whiting i (laughs) commend all right so for my Number one pick, I went with something a little more wholesome, a little more endearing, which I imagine is going to upset David a little bit because he is heartless. Um, Facts. But I went with a tiny little movie, a little obscure. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. It came out in 1994. A little film called Forrest Gump. (laughs) I had a nightmare about this last night. Oh, man, tell us. This exact moment. No, this is like my, my nightmare is coming true. Ooh, what if you're asleep right now? Pinch yourself. <laughs> Slap yourself in the face. <laughs> Hard. Uh, so, I mean, I feel like I don't have to give a synopsis of um, Forrest Gump. You should know the story. Um, I mean, I'm going to hit a bunch of points here. I'm going to kind of list for a minute. And- Whoa, now. We do have a lot of Gen Z listeners. Yeah. Like, you know, Mary- they're idiots. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, like, some of them aren't. Like, Mary, you're, you're not an idiot, but you have a bunch of weird habits that kind of make me discount you a little bit. You, you just want to let them know that this is the prequel to Bubba Gump Shrimp Company. <laughs> you know well, what, the it's the prequel to a lot of things. We're joking, but if we had Mary in here, I bet she hasn't seen Forrest Gump and doesn't know what it's about. I would <laughs> put money on it. Well, I mean, essentially, Forrest Gump is this. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we pick up. Uh, it, it's The whole thing is told from Forrest Gump as a man telling his life story to the random people he's sitting next to on a bench waiting for a bus. Um, but the story picks up as him as a small child. Um, he is named after the founder of the KKK. Um, and this man is, um, I don't know, like back then you just called these people simple, you know what I mean? But he probably has like, uh, he's probably like autistic of some sort, you know, yeah. I mean? his information very differently. I mean, he's in leg braces as like a young kid um, because he, he has, probably has like cerebral palsy. Or something. No, I'm pretty sure it's scoli- because they fix them. They straighten them out. Um, I'm pretty sure it was like some type of scoliosis because he's saying like, what does the doctor say? His, uh, his back is as crooked as a politician. <laughs> um he's also they mentioned at the school he's got an iq of 75 so they just kind of like said it but the reason i chose this as one of my as like my most favorite most american movie is because it is so american and i still very much enjoy this movie uh tom hanks how, how are you gonna shun tom hanks out of here you know what i mean i gotta I say i'm very surprised 
Yeah, and this is one of the many movies that Tom Hanks takes a long pee in because that's just something he likes to do. I think he puts it in a lot of his contracts. Like, there (laughs) has to be a scene of him peeing. Um, That's something I remember hearing somewhere. That didn't just come out of my head. (laughs) Um, But... (laughs) I mean, it's it tells the story of this man trying to make it through life, but it does it in a way that it touches every like big reference point that it can in American history while trying to connect it to this person. And now I'm going to start listing some things in chronological order of how they happen in the movie because it's just so funny how much they shoehorn in. And that's a very American thing. Rewriting uh, like a piece of history or remembering an era a certain way and just kind of like rewriting it to fit your narrative a little bit more and i'm just not talking about films but like textbooks <laughs> you are you saying revisionist history <laughs> i was alluding to it yes um but this young man forrest gump gave elvis his signature dance move as a young child when he was still in the braces uh, was an all-american football player at the university of alabama at the time the school was being integrated uh, meets President Kennedy as a result of becoming um, that All-American. And there's a couple president scenes. They all have horrible CGI in the face. Like, um, hmm. there's some, some comedy movie where it has a baby talk for a second, and it looks that bad. Um, I wish I could remember what it is right now. Man, I don't remember that looking so bad, but it's been oh. a long time since I've seen this. Horrible, dude. Um, he enlists in the Army during Vietnam, and that's where he meets uh, Bubba the Shrimp Man and Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> uh, Lieutenant Dan plays a part throughout the entire movie Bubba um, he befriends him he tells him all about the shrimp and business spoiler alerts <clears throat> this movie came out in 1994 um, bless you uh, he makes him promise that they're going to go into business together Bubba dies and that's how Forrest starts the Bubba Gump shrimp company which is like is an actual shrimp company um, well I don't know if it's an actual shrimp company but it is a restaurant is it's it, definitely is it- a restaurant I don't know if they're. I don't know if they're suppliers. You know what I mean. I don't think Tom. I don't think Tom Hanks is out on that boat right now with with magic legs, Lieutenant Dan. But it's possible. Well, they won't revise that until the sequel company? comes out. It's definitely not Tom Hanks and Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> Are you sure? I've seen that movie. <laughs> yes, David. I'm positive. Um, he saves a bunch of people in Vietnam. Gets awarded the Medal of Honor, which is like not some small deal. It's a pretty big deal. Yeah. President Johnson as a result of this. So we get another trip to the White House. Um, he meets John Lennon. Uh, oh, no, I skipped. He He's wounded in Vietnam. So instead of going back into action, they put him on the All-American ping pong team. And he's part of that group that does that diplomatic like journey to China to play in a ping pong tournament. Is like the first time Americans had like been on Chinese soil in forever, um, which obviously didn't happen. Um, but it's just another shoehorn of history in there. As a result of that, um, he meets John Lennon on a talk show, um, and they, they have they do this like uh, gag where they kind of conversationally run through some of the lyrics of Imagine, um, which is really silly. Um, a lot of it is extremely silly, and I don't mean like like huh, you're so silly, but like that's stupid. <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> you know what? It's more like stop. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I've never. I don't like this movie, but I was trying to like this time. I'm like trying to articulate what it is. I didn't like, but as Frank is listing this, it's making me realize it's this is the Superman of inspirational movies. In that they're writing this script and they're like, I don't know what inspirational moment in history to do. Let's just do all of them. Like let's do everything we can do from the 50s to the 90s. Um, let's give someone AIDS. Let's just do it. Let's go, let's go for it all. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. Um, Even like really tiny things. Um, he meets, he reunites with Lieutenant Dan as he's walking out of that studio and they do an Al Pacino, uh, reference when they're crossing the street, they do the, uh, Hey, I'm walking here. Yeah, I'm walking. And I, I don't think I've ever caught it before. Like, that's when, funny. um, he meets president nixon uh for being on the all-american ping pong team as well and nixon puts him up in the watergate hotel and <laughs> flashlights from the scandal wake him up so he calls and complains so he's the one who spills the beans on watergate um uh he invests in a small startup with his money earned in the bubble gum shrimp company in a small what he thinks is some fruit company called apple um like as they're starting up uh, and then he does this. They take this really weird scene in the movie. The whole 
So we'll get into a little bit of complaining here because it, it has to be said. Jenny's horrible. <laughs> She's like, the worst. She is the worst. You know what I mean? She keeps coming into Forrest's life, reminding Forrest how much like he loves her, and then just like just like bailing out. You know what I mean? And she has all these things going on, but she's just like the worst. Um, so after losing Jenny one of these times, Forrest spends like three or four years just running around the country. Like he wants to run coast. He runs really running. While he's doing that, and these are the tiny little pieces of history that I'm talking about, like there's no reason for this to be in here at all, but this is America, so let's shove it in there. Um, he creates the it happens uh, bumper sticker, like offhandedly to some guy he's talking to. Um, this is all one unwittingly, like he's not doing any of this stuff on purpose. He's just stumbling through it. He also creates the like uh, the classic like smiley face logo, like that was on t-shirts, like in the late nineties or the two thousand. Yeah. Isn't it cause some dude hands him like a t-shirt and while he's yeah. running and he yeah. just like puts his face in it him for ideas and he's like covered in mud. He just wipes it and it's just there. Um, and one big thing as well that makes us super American because this man is a national treasure and I will stab <laughs> anybody who says anything different. It's yeah. hit Joel Osment's first feature film role. Oh, that's right. He's he's the little uh, Bert and Ernie kid at the end. Uh, he's Forrest Jr. Yeah, there we go. Oh, yeah. He has like a, a baby and a night of passion with Jenny. But like we don't have to get into it too much because Jenny just like, oh, he saw him running. The way I feel about the end, Jenny saw him running and she was like, oh, I have this like AIDS thing now. I'm not going to die. We should probably uh, reach out to him. Yeah. This rich dude so she can take care of the baby before I die. You know what I mean? That's she how gets it. her comeuppance for sure. <laughs> aids <laughs> yeah um um but uh this movie's so american you know what i mean it goes all over the place he even hits this part when he's talking to jenny at the end of which like um she i forget what they're talking about but he just kind of goes through like yeah when i was in vietnam like i remember this and he's describing scenery and he's like but the stars just reminded me of like he talks about like the texas desert like uh sunrises and just like uh, different vistas, the water is so clear in some part of like uh, Colorado where you saw this thing. He just describes all these like chunks of America so beautifully. And it's not like uh, Tom Hanks did it, but the the writer in the screenplay. This movie is based off of a novel of the same name. Um, but yeah, man, it's just like solid, <laughs> solid, stupid American, so overtly American. And I kind of wanted to go when I first started out on this journey with just like explosions explosions everywhere that was like my first impulse but like uh i don't know i feel like the nostalgia blindness is a little bit more you like a <laughs> yeah you know what i mean like the good old days mentality <laughs> i feel like you, you definitely chose a movie that again started like i wouldn't say started but definitely heightened a genre of film from there after with revisionist history and and Kind of like in the way I would like to say something like Almost Famous does it. You know what I mean? Where it's like, okay, this person had, this fictional character had this much influence on all these other famous events and uh, Um, bands. You know what I'm saying? And while you're at it, Almost Heroes too. But I mean, that movie's not good, so we don't have to talk about (laughs) it anymore. (laughs) I don't think I've seen that movie. It's not Um, yeah, Forrest Gump, the, the cheese is just a little too thick for me, but this is a fun Forrest Gump fact that I always like to share because it is based on a book. I don't know if you guys know this, but when you watch that movie, you're like, why is Jenny even interested in Forrest Gump? And like, why is this continuing? You know what I mean? Like when they're kids, okay, sure. But when she's like with the Black Panthers or whatever, like <laughs> what's going on here? You know what I mean? In the book, we find out that Forrest Gump is packing everybody nice it's not shrimps it's some prawns down there you know what i'm saying gump's got a stump yeah and that is what jenny's sticking around for and that is like exactly what is written into the book um which is terrible (laughs) it's terrible that doesn't fit like the bubble gum of this movie so i feel like that to take it out yeah that's probably why they did that (laughs) we're barely going to get away with aids let's let's cut this other part out too Oh, he's also he also speaks. I can't believe I forgot about it, but he speaks on like uh, the march against the war in Vietnam, like the big one, like a Capitol Hill in Washington D.C. They like shove him in there too, and that's when he runs into the Black Panthers and everything. Yeah, this is a weird movie to me. I, like, oh, it's super weird. What, I, I still enjoy it, like how heavy-handed it is. 
It's just a movie about nostalgia. You know what I mean? I guess it's like, Hey, everyone in the nineties, we made this movie about your childhood told from this perspective of Tom Hanks and everybody's like, I love big. And then they watched it. I don't know. But you know what? I have, I have nothing positive to say. So like my mom would suggest, I'm just going to move along. I think, I think it's Daniel's turn, right? What's What's your number one, man? Well, my friends, I really hope that someone else is in this wagon that's moving on along with me. Oh, well, it's just me. Let's see. Because my number one is the year 2000, Roland Emmerich. Godzilla? Yes. No. <laughs> the Patriot. Nice, nice. USA. USA, USA, USA. 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 Only reason I didn't choose the Patriot is because I know for sure when we do, if we do like period or like when we do Revolutionary War, when there's probably I'm probably gonna talk about the Patriot like <laughs> one or two more times after this. <laughs> That's fair, and we're, we're gonna see Ali this movie too next week. I think it's our next thing coming out. Which is it weird is. because this is kind of like character limit extended before the mo- reviews even out. So we did it backwards. We did, but I also picked the Patriot. Hey, uh, what up? Hey, I just, I mean, I, I was bored and I, I didn't have time. Uh, let's just say this. I was going to time it out so that I could watch it again for the CLE, but I was sitting around and I was just like, you know what? This is just staring at me in the face while on Netflix. And I was like, it's on Netflix. The events coincided but this movie is just amazing i put it on for five minutes i was like all right i'm hooked i'm watching this entire movie and even though it has a very slow build it just pulls you in and it gets better and better man yeah. talk about payoff like at every turn at every turn it pays off it's it's really long um but yeah. it has a clear three-act structure and the first two acts end like awesome like the like as soon as you finish those that first act you're like well, what's happening next you know what i mean exactly and then the second act ends you're like oh my god how's this gonna end and then it does and you <laughs> yeah, see a true good. like progression of character you know what i mean mm-hmm. like mel gibson is someone who you think you know at the beginning of the movie but you don't know his actual past and who he was in the past and you see him not only return to that but get amplified beyond that like well, by the end of it it's real good character development, except for that second son. You know what I'm talking about? The one who's just a little <laughs> bit younger. William, I think. Yeah. William, yeah. yeah, sorry. You're not getting much of a character development. I'm out of there real early, you know what I mean? <laughs> that kid's got a weird face, man. <laughs> like, we get a big as a shock with Mel Gibson's character is, like, his two small sons get when they find out, like, oh, my God, my daddy is a killing machine. Like, they hadn't invented John Wick yet, but that's John Wick. <laughs> Dude, that moment when William dies and then he just like snaps and he takes, takes his two sons into the woods, you know, to do like the first guerrilla attack on a caravan is just amazing because you're just like, okay, who is this? This story has totally changed, but also his sons are experiencing that at the same time. And he's also just like, remember what I taught you, right? And he's like, aim small, aim, miss small, aim small, miss small. <laughs> oh, you know what? His, his kid is, it's Thomas is the one who dies. And he's the That's kid right. from, he's the kid from small soldiers. He's Alan That's Abernathy. who it is. Oh. Yeah, so he had, he had a couple Dude. good roles. Uh, uh, Hocus Pocus. Oh, yeah, yeah, the Hocus Pocus kid. He had some oh. good ones. One of, his, one of his sons is one of the kids from, is the kid from Jurassic Park 3, too. Oh, that, weird. Sure. Yeah. Um, when, you know, the aim small, miss small thing, I just read a little tidbit online about how for the movie they had to train Heath Ledger and Mel Gibson to fire muskets and how to reload them so they looked authentic. Um, and their shooting coach uh, gave them that advice. He yeah. was like, if you aim for a man and you miss, that's a big miss. But if you aim for his button and you miss, you're probably still going to hit him. I was like, ooh, that's interesting. That's and good advice. He, he snuck it into the movie, which I thought was pretty cool. I also saw, as far as tidbits go, that's a really good one. I, I had heard that originally Harrison Ford was – approached to uh play mel ribson's uh mel, mel ribson's goal mel gibson's role <laughs> you know he might have uh, been able to pull that off but i think know, so we would have gotten robbed of some really good mel gibson man cries like, this, these are probably some of the best in this movie yeah he he was made for this role for sure 
you know, yeah. speaking of the cast, though, this is a weird crossover. And I didn't know this until I was looking up stuff afterwards. But Mel Gibson was originally thought for Nick Naylor in Thank You for Smoking when they were going to do it in the 90s. He was going to originally be Aaron Eckhart's character. And I was like, wow, you know, that could have worked, too. I could have seen Mel Gibson taking that role. It'd just be um, like the character from What Women Want before he electrocuted himself. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, apparently Harrison Ford said, you know, I feel like the story boils down the American Revolutionary War to one man's revenge. Hmm. And it's like, I guess, but it That's also fair. tells a bit of the story in other theaters throughout the entire m- movie, you know? Yeah. I d- you- oh, go ahead, David. Oh, sorry. I just, I got to toss this out really quick. And and this is interesting because uh, while looking at this movie online, a lot of people were criticizing this, especially when it came out, but... For a movie that is shown so frequently in eighth grade history class, it's not terribly historically accurate. Like there are quite a few historical inaccuracies. So this shouldn't, this isn't like the movie to watch for authentic American revolution stuff. This is like, do you want to watch John Wick in 1776? Then this is like the movie to watch. Apparently the most accurate part of it was the costume design. Because apparently the Smithsonian actually overlooked like the costume design department and everything, the muskets, everything like that. Yeah. And the, and the costuming is done by Deborah Scott. I wrote this down because the costumes are so amazing. Um, they, they made individual uniforms for everybody, like full detailed uniforms, like it's Lord of the Rings or something. Um, and she's also the lady who did the costuming work on Titanic. So it was mm. like, man, this chick had a good five years. She was, or no, I'm sorry. <laughs> Titanic was what? 99 90 or 98 Five? it was really close uh, yeah maybe 95 or 90 i don't know whatever yeah it's mid 90s mid to late 90s but yeah um 800 extras in this movie dude it was I mean, huge you need all that cannon fodder you know what i mean it, d- yeah and that's another <laughs> that's another part of this movie that really I'll highlighted i'll take a leg off exactly that's another part of this movie that really highlighted the idiocies of like early warfare in terms of like musket warfare it's just like I don't know. I'm, I'm really glad they painted that on screen because, like, Raven and I were watching it and we were just like, why are they just standing in a line taking turns, like, single shooting at each other? Because that's well, the gentleman's way. Well, it's the yeah. gentleman's way, but it also, like, made the most sense for that time because, like, say, for instance, the British were marching like that and instead the Americans just, like, spread out and tried to take them in the field. It's like that wall of bullets is just going to destroy you. So I guess they found out that was the most effective thing and then it was like, I mean, until semi-automatic weapons were available <laughs> that was like the best bet you had because the guns were so terrible you could but shoot like very how, far. Uh, it worked for the militia because they were such a small group that they were just like well what if we like hid behind a tree or something yeah yeah, what, yeah. <laughs> and what if we surprise them you know what i mean yeah, don't fight in an open field <laughs> but the militia we were coming <laughs> but the militia doesn't fight against armies for almost any of the movie you know what i mean all they're doing is like taking caravans. little caravans or you know messages patrols causing or whatever yeah causing a ruckus um but you know what heath ledger brought this up too and heath ledger was saying that and he, he had a great quote on this i actually wrote it down i was watching an interview with that that handsome handsome man and he was saying that he respected the honor of combat it wasn't pressing a button and dropping a bomb it was like if you were going to fight in a war it was like the hearts of men that won that war and i was like dang heath ledger that's beautiful. Another thing he said also is because he wasn't familiar with American history, he actually read up a ton about the Revolutionary War. And he, quote, understood why Americans fl- flew their flag so high. And it's because they won this war by dragging their hearts through the mud. Yeah. Winning a war that they shouldn't have been able to win. No, by any honestly, means. Quite honestly, yeah. By no means. Um, and it's crazy to think about, like, there's all the dudes with the muskets and everything, and you're charging other dudes with muskets. But, like, at the same time, there's, like, a 13-year-old boy with a drum, you know what I mean? And a 15-year-old yeah. with a flag, like, right next to a guy that's only a flag holder. They got nothing, you know what I mean? They're just running with that flag and that drum. Like, that's I, insane. I remember even back in history class being like, what? Why? But then mm-hmm. you learn, like, well, I guess the rules of war were more closely followed. You know, you're not supposed to shoot that person because it's their cadence that helps marching, just like you're not supposed to shoot officers. And yeah, I actually and deliver like uh, like uh, field orders and stuff. Yeah, and I really liked in this movie that they have that whole parlay scene where oh, with Cornwallis. Yeah, where some of his men get captured, and Mel Gibson rides in on the white flag, and it's like, man, this would never happen today. No, it wouldn't. No. It wouldn't be like, oh, let's go to ISIS's base real quick. Hey, here's our commander. He's just riding in. 
hey, we want to, we want to, you know, do a prisoner exchange or whatever. Do you have any grievances you want to file first? It's so ridiculous. I did love that. He's just like, well, since you were the, I, I relay it to you since you were the gr- grievance officer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, that's really good. Um, and I feel like it just cements it for me. I don't know how you guys feel, but if I had to, if I had to fight in one American war throughout time, I feel like American Revolution would be the lowest one on that list. That's would, a bloody war, man. Dude, that is rough. I wouldn't even do the Civil War. You know what no, I mean? Sure That's I even worse. Say I would put the Civil War right underneath the American Revolution, but those are bottom two. Yeah, <laughs> really, really bad, man. And, and, and then, then Vietnam, World War One. Yeah, oh, I don't know. I, I might pick World War One over Vietnam. I don't know. That's tough. I feel like you have some better weapons to work with in World War Two, at least. Yeah. I was because he had figured out like the whole world had started to really figure out like really efficient ways to kill each other. Mm. <laughs> Airplanes. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? Something I thought too, and this kind of relates to the whole um, historical part, but some of the inaccuracies in the movie that I just thought were interesting to point out in the movie, you have one of the, and, and maybe Danny can help me with this. One of the uh, Baldwin's, but it's like the Baldwin cousin. What's his name? Um, he plays like a loyalist. He plays one of the guys who sides with the... Yeah, the the one from the town that ends up oh, like... I know exactly like, what you're talking about. Yeah, I know. I that, didn't know that was a Baldwin cousin. Oh, huh. it's Adam Baldwin. He's he's distantly related to the famous Baldwin brothers. Um, and I, you know, he's my favorite Baldwin, to be honest. He's also in Independence Day, like him and Roland Emmerich, I guess, are buds. Yeah, he is. But he's also the one in Firefly. He's Jane from Firefly. Um, I've not seen Firefly. Oh, man, you got to watch Firefly. That is, that's <laughs> just some good sci-fi right there, man. It's the best. Yeah. And strangely, pretty American, too. You know what I mean? Although there's a lot of China in the future. Um, and probably in our future. But anyway. There probably will be. Yeah. <laughs> but oh. there was... What they were saying though is that like they portrayed this as where like he was the only traitor in that whole village, but when you look at statistics of people who fought on each side, it's like there were way more loyalists. Like there was a huge. It wasn't like everyone was. Let's fight for patriotism and freedom, and there was like one guy who was like, "No, I'm going to join the bubble." No, it's, it was pretty. It wasn't maybe not dead even, but there was a lot more loyalists. And then also, th- I thought this was interesting. Oh, I'm sorry. If we no, would have had the uh, USA chant then, it probably would have been more, you know, but it hadn't been invented yet. They were working on it. And there's a few the things. was that 9-11 wasn't around yet. <laughs> it was a lot yeah. harder to just rally people to a cause. Yeah. How do you just scare up patriotism like that? <laughs> um, but also the, the, the role of black people in the movie, which this movie actually got a lot of criticism from Spike Lee saying that they made a movie about the Revolutionary War and didn't touch on racism and slavery whatsoever, which I kind of agree with, but they also, they do have a whole storyline about this guy who is a slave and... A friend of Donald Logue, right? Mm -hmm. At the end. (laughs) At the end, uh, yeah, he's like racist. They have a Remember the Titans moment. Um, But that didn't exist <laughs> they they did not grant slaves freedom for fighting in the american revolution they did grant slaves freedom if you were fighting for britain of course they lost um but i thought that was interesting they kind of wrote in this like really whitewashed history where it was like we're building a new world no not for you though not really it's funny that you say that because when i was watching the movie it took me up until maybe like the third act to realize that the the um the black man that was fighting on the American revolutionist side was fighting for his freedom through the revolutionist side. Because when I saw the poster that he was looking at, I was like, well, yeah, that makes sense. English, England did do that. Mm-hmm. And, and there were no slaves in England at that time. So Yeah. And there weren't even black soldiers fighting for the American side in the American revolution. But this is like, so, but you know, I don't mind it so much. Speaking of revisionist history, I don't mind it so much in a movie like this, where I think we're already kind of detached from reality. You know what I mean? Like, why not have a little more representation in your movie? Um, but if the movie was like slightly more realistic, then I think it would have been something that needed to be addressed. But just also the, last... the fact that this took place in South Carolina. Yeah. It's like in South Carolina, no way, which not likely, <laughs> which also it's like Mel Gibson has this giant plantation. And then we find out that he doesn't own any of those slaves. They're all working there as free men. And I'm yeah. like, you just didn't want to make your hero a slaver is what's going on. Like, let's be well, honest. Uh, within um, the first, oh, go ahead. Right. I just said highly unlikely. I hate this yeah. so much. Within, within the first 
15 minutes, I, I saw them working on the farm and I was just like, ah, oh, this is a little problematic. And then he's just like, you know, you'll be free if you fight for us. He's like, oh, we, we just work here because we want to work here. We're free already. And I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. It, it's a, there, there's a couple of cringy moments like that. For most of it, the script is really strong. Um, and the script is, uh, we've mentioned this in the last episode. It's by Robert Rodat, who did the Saving Private Ryan script. Um, but there's a couple things that feel really like kind of forced, more Independence Day than Saving Private Ryan, like real cheesy stuff. And I think also in the last like 40 minutes when they really start killing people, they really just kind of drop the script off. It's like, we're going full one-liners from here on out. Where at the beginning, there's all these like really thoughtful conversations and perspectives about war and everything. And then at the end, they're like, now nah, let's blow stuff up. Boom, boom, boom. And they're just like shooting everyone, which is great. You just <laughs> start to get yourself worked into a frenzy. You know what I mean? And by mm -hmm. the end, you're like, and then his leg blows off. <laughs> and then you just see blood splurt out of his face. Oh, so I was watching behind the scenes. I, I was checking out the Patriot, the extended cut, everyone. I didn't know this Ooh. thing had an extended cut. Is it even more revolutionary? Was it three hours straight, probably? Uh, I think the movie's two hours and 40 minutes, but with the extended cut, it's 250. So it's Does like it an extra 10 minutes. Of Apocalypto cut into it. <laughs> Just <laughs> test footage. Um, no, it actually, most of it is little conversations that develop the characters. Seldomly would I say you should watch the extended version of a movie, but I think this one actually is a little bit cooler. Are you saying that the extended cut is much better, bro? You should watch it? I would say so. You know what? If if you don't like The Patriot, if, if you just don't like the, the vision of The Patriot, I, I have an extended cut that's four and a half hours long. <laughs> and it makes it pretty watchable. By the, it's not great. It's watchable. But at least the Batman stuff works. You know what I mean? There's a lot of other scenes you got to skip through. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Release the Snyder Cut. Release the Snyder Cut. Oh, it's already <laughs> happening. Oh, but about the gore that Frank was talking about. So there's that famous scene. And I'm assuming you guys watched this in eighth grade history too. You know what I mean? That's just the world we live in. But when that cannonball shoots out and it <laughs> takes that guy's head off, um, I saw a behind the scenes on how they made it. And it's CGI, of course, but... Um, they didn't actually take someone's head off, but oh, darn. Roland Emmerich is so excited about that scene. And he's just talking about it like giddy, like a, like a schoolboy. And he's like, when we first tested this, the shot, people were gasping in the audience. And that's when, you know, you have something that works when people are gasping. And I was like, Jesus, man, are you making a snuff film? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I do was, like it when it rolls and rips that dude's knee off too. And they were and saying that they did, they did a wire. They had a wire attached to a ball. So they pulled the ball really fast. They had a stunt guy, you know, like fall back and then they digitally removed the legs. Um, wow. Cool That's stuff. Actually. Easier than physically removing the legs. Apparently yeah. they had a lot of amputees in the cast too. Oh, I wouldn't be surprised, especially because of just that, you know, time period and i feel like back then that's what you did like today you can get away with oh, that yeah. a little bit more just put a green sleeve on someone's leg or something oh there's no antibiotics they, they have to cut something off if it's too <laughs> that's a whole nother thing off. too man jeez just getting your leg sawn off in the middle oh of no the field. i swear to god it's just splinter please <laughs> <laughs> just wide awake just in it you know what i mean oh. take some whiskey <laughs> Oh my gosh. Oh, well, you know, I have one more little fun fact about this movie I thought was cool. Heath Ledger was going to quit acting. And and to to shout out to another channel movie, 10 Things I Hate About You, another great Heath Ledger picture. Um but after that, he didn't work for almost a whole year as an actor because all the offers he got were for these like teen heartthrob roles and he's like, "Nah." And he was about to quit acting and move back to Australia when he got this role. And, and man, this is a great Heath Ledger role, man. Ooh, and it's a shame, you know, you really don't see him in anything anymore. It's a, it's a damn shame. <laughs> you bastard. Yeah, it's funny is <laughs> apparently Jake Gyllenhaal had um, auditioned a couple of times for the role that Heath Ledger ended up getting for Gabriel. And wow. it's weird because then the next movie after that, they're both in Brokeback Mountain together. Hmm. I guess they made up. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> wow what a terrible joke what a terrible joke it was bad but i liked it <laughs> <laughs> um man i just feel like in case you haven't seen the patriot obviously the reason why it's the american movie is because of the american revolution of course but literally the scene 
of Mel Gibson holding that American flag, like hold the line. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's, that's as American as it gets guys. As far as I'm concerned, that might be the most American shot in cinema history. I don't know. Did you guys also know? Oh, go ahead, Frank. I just said it might be. It's just me saying <laughs> significant things and getting ducked out and having to review. <laughs> Disregard. <laughs> Quack. Uh, so apparently the theme music for The Patriot, which is also really great, was played at Barack Obama's acceptance speech on election night. Whoa. 2008. And do and you know who wrote that music, Danny B? Mr. J. Wills. John Williams back again, man. This is one I didn't, I didn't know he wrote this one. I didn't either. And when I saw it at the beginning, I was like, Oh, interesting. But you know, what's funny. The first like three notes is the Neptune movement of the planets. Mm. And I was like, man, who's this hacky composer ripping off Holst? And I was like, Oh, it's John Williams. He loves ripping off Holst. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like all of star Wars is just the planets. <laughs> So he just couldn't get his hands off of it for long enough. He had to bring it back to squeeze one more paycheck out of it. I love me some John Wills. Yeah, me too. Um, as much as I dog him, I-, I love his work. And this one's good. You feel the patriotism. He gets the patriotism. <laughs> and that score probably feels the least like Harry Potter or Star Wars. You know what I mean? Mm. That one kind of stands on its own. Um, one thing I would want to shout out, even though it's not my movie, um, just the scene, the first revenge scene of Mel Gibson when he finally catches on the very tail end of that scene, when he runs down the last dude with the tomahawk and he's just bashing him and bashing him and bashing him. And there's just blood all over his face. So intense. And his hair's all over the place. You're like, Oh my God. Yes. Let's do this. It also cracks me up. I don't know if you guys ever watched this movie like on TNT or something in the daytime, but when they got to that scene, they didn't cut it out. They just like color corrected it so that all the blood was brown. So it looked like he was just in a big pile of mud. Oh, it looks so God. dumb. He's like hitting stuff and all this mud's coming up everywhere. <laughs> oh my God. So don't watch it on TBS, everybody. You got to watch it on Netflix. Just yeah, this is meant pro- to be bloody pro-, pro tip. Yeah, it definitely is. <laughs> Yeah, TBS knows funny. It don't know nothing about the Patriot. It don't know. It don't know patriotism. That's what it doesn't know. Um. Well, I don't know. Are you guys? Uh, are we wrapped up here? Are we moving on? Well, what's uh? What's old Frank's? I was one. the first one to go. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, his was Forrest Gump. Mm. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think a- I was just so underwhelmed that I was wondering for your next one, Frank. <laughs> Well, thank you for your support. We can go ahead and go to the next segment. Now okay. Get- you know what? I, I won't be petty against Frank. I'll wait till we're done recording and then I'll give him crap. Um, well, everyone, it's time for... Oh, that's interesting. And everyone, I was so excited because I, I was looking up funny news. We're recording on June 23rd. 2020 and i found an article from today here's the headline for you mel gibson denies winona Ryder's allegations of bigoted comments and this is from the guardian everyone apparently mel gibson is under heat right now everyone again he's, he's in danger of being canceled part two for his heated uh comments that he made against winona Ryder. now when i read this i was excited because i thought hey uh, this is new, but it's not. This is something that happened like a decade ago. <laughs> and Mel Gibson has said, this is 100% untrue. I can't do a Mel Gibson impression. I'm sorry, everyone. She lied about it over a decade ago when she talked to the press and she's lying about it now. That sounds a lot like our president. Yeah, right? This sounds straight up. Or this, this is giving me uh, flashbacks to the uh, Kavanaugh hearing. Mm. Um, here is, here's what Miss Ryder has said. We were at a crowded party with one of my good friends and Mel Gibson was smoking a cigar and we're all talking. And he said to my friend who's gay, Oh wait, am I going to get AIDS? And then something came up about Jews and he said, "Uh "Oh, you're not an oven dodger. Are you? Oh my God. Ryder claims that Gibson later tried to apologize. Something that his rep also claims to be untrue. She lied about him. <laughs> she, I would never say that, and I would never, ever <laughs> apologize. 
Uh, she has since replied to his denial. I believe in redemption and forgiveness and hope that Mr. Gibson has found a healthy way to deal with his demons, but I am not one of them. Lord. Man, I feel like Winona Ryder just, she's playing this, this cancel culture game, right? She dropped a bomb on him and she's like, you know what? I believe that you can change. She's just taking such like <laughs> a high road. Yeah, superior moral high road over it. And you know what? I believe Mel Gibson said those things. <laughs> I definitely believe he said those things. I buy that 100%. Um, yeah, and then <laughs> this, uh, this article ends just with a summary of his past. In 1991, Gibson made derogatory remarks about gay sex and claimed he would never be confused for a gay man because of the way he looks and moves. I'm not well, haven't, people also don't know that he's in what women want, so he can't be gay. That's true. What if at the end of that movie, instead of him like losing that power, which I think is what happens in that movie, I don't remember, he just wakes up one day and it's only men that he hears. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's like, oh, plot twist. He would have walked out of that movie. Ooh, that, no, that movie will never be made. What men oh. want. What man? <laughs> well, that's a Chappelle show skit. I don't know if you guys. Oh, know. right, yeah, that's right. That, that one's hilarious. Um, and then it goes over his 2006 DUI arrest, which of course is infamous, infamous, and terrible. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, Gibson is set to come out in a couple of movies, uh, an action film called Boss Level, and a Christmas comedy called Fat Man. And. Um, and apparently they revealed today that they're going to recast his voice role in the chicken run sequel. Ah, which first well, off they are making a chicken run sequel. Yeah. Chicken run sequel. First off, yes, they second, are. <laughs> sorry, Mel, you lost it. So I don't know. Also, also hmm. I have recently heard that big, big daddy Mel is working on passion of the Christ too, y'all the <gasps> resurrection. I have heard about that. He's coming. And JC is returning. Jim Caviezel. <laughs> Dang. He's going to look old, man. That's a long three days. What are they going to do? He's had a rough 15 years or so, too. <laughs> so, what is the sequel to Passion of the Christ going to be about? The Ascension? The Just Resurrection. Out afterwards when he came back. Yeah, it's when he comes out of the cave. <laughs> hey, I'm alive. Sounds considerably less brutal than the first one. <laughs> I would imagine he comes back out of the cave. He meets up with the apostles and they're like, Jesus, they're going to shut down the rec center. We need $50 <laughs> to say the rec center. And Jesus is like, actually, on the way here, I saw that there's a dance contest and the prize is $15,000. And they saved the rec center. My money's on that plot. That would be the best. I'm I'm gonna bet actually on the most unlikely. I'm gonna say that Mel Gibson is just gonna get Jim Caviezel again, and they're just gonna reboot their own movie. It's gonna be the first reboot with the same director and the same star, and even the same script. They're just gonna do it twice. They just want to up the special it. effects. You know what I mean? <laughs> Yikes! Uh, so watch out for Passion of the Christ Two, Electric Boogaloo, The Resurrection coming out. 2022 or something Shaville. apparently nope. he was he was quoted as saying it's going to be the biggest movie ever what would be wild is if he just if he just wrote like a non-biblical like he wrote his own sequel you know what i mean here's what i would have done next if i was writing the bible that would be controversial i would like to see that though <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Y'all, this movie is slated for 2021. Whoa. Ooh. And you know it's going to come out on Easter. Um, <laughs> oh, man. That's the one last crazy thing that I forgot about the Patriot. Um, while we're still talking about old Mel here, they planned the Patriot. It came out June 27th, uh, 2000. It was supposed to be like the big July 4th movie. Everyone go see the Patriot. And it got blown out of the water by the perfect storm. Which made twice as much money opening weekend. Ooh, that's crazy. Because that movie's pretty good too. But like, if I had to pick, I'm tossing the Patriot in. And I feel like that movie is way more relevant today than The Perfect Storm is. And IMDb at least seems to agree that the Patriot's better anyways. Um, I just thought that was so funny. I don't remember that movie having such a big storm around it, but I guess it did. So, Damn you, David. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Well, are you guys ready to finish this episode off or what? Let's, Let's do some. Peeps and predict it. 
And and what does that entail? What exactly is that? Uh, jars, uh, little bits of paper, um, a grouping of peeps, if you will, that are two fictional or non-fictional characters or people. Um, and they face off in two to three rounds of predicaments or predicts, if you will. Uh, by the way, if you have any suggestions for peeps or predicts, send your suggestions in an email, I guess, if you want to do it that way, in a comment down below. Um, write a letter and mail it somewhere. Uh, carry your Frank and beans at gmail.com. <laughs> Sorry. Nailed it. <laughs> For our peeps, we have JCVD versus Arnold. In case you didn't understand that, Jean-Claude Van Damme versus Arnold Schwarzenegger. Blood sports, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Why we'll not? <laughs> and for their predicament today let me see here who would be more likely to star in Bloodsport <laughs> no I'm just joking um, <laughs> who would have the most maxed out credit cards I will open the floor for debate Huh. Very interesting. Well, if you guys are still thinking about it, my, my, my brain's already got one idea. So what kind of people have maxed out credit cards? People who once, yeah, fiscally irresponsible people and people who once were used to making much more than they're probably making now. So who who who's making considerably <laughs> less today, John Claude Van Damme or Arnold Schwarzenegger? You know what I mean? Well, probably both of them, considering like like if we're talking about like their peak. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're yeah. both probably earning way less than they were. Oh yeah, I'm sure. But all I mean is like, what's the last John Claude Van Damme movie that came out versus you know the six Terminator reboots they put out in the last two years? That Arnold uh, is in all of them. <laughs> John Claude just had that uh, that commercial of him doing splits between the two uh, self driving uh, tra- tractor trailers. You know what I mean? And that was a while ago already. <laughs> I haven't seen that. That sounds awesome. It sounds like a great way to die too. Like just <laughs> that's waiting for something wrong to happen. You can't die in an accident if you're Jean Claude Van Damme. I think you just wait for your life source to run out. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta say, I'm sure John Claude Van Damme has made a sizable income you know just giving martial arts speeches and you know doing seminars and stuff but arnie not only has the pension of the government behind him but well, he's arnie. also no he still does i'm sure he's like set you know yeah. once a governor you're still good oh you said but, pension. i heard penchant oh no <laughs> also a good word but yeah i'm sure he has like a pension <laughs> pension's a great word <laughs> The best. Not many people know about that word pension. All right, guys, we're here today to talk about the word pension and how dope. <laughs> it is. Um, but I mean, I would argue and say that Arnie is not only more famous; he has a probably much more royalties in the amount of uh, you know what he's getting from lasting uh, IPs and all that. And um, you know, he probably's got like a workout regimen that he can sell. I, he's making more money. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to make one last ditch effort to see if I can convert anybody to Overside just for fun, as I do. So the one argument I can see of Arnold Schwarzenegger racking up some serious credit card debt. Arnold Schwarzenegger in his past has had some issues with discrepancies in his marriage. You know what I mean? He's been known to like have a mistress sidekick or two. Hush money gets expensive really quick. And the kids you you get that who actually get found out, now you got to pay child support, man. You know how expensive it is to keep a bunch of kids fed and clothed and in school and entertained right now? All the all the video games and stuff they're going to need from being in quarantine? It's got to get expensive real quick. Dang. I mean, that is a pretty good point, but I feel like I feel like if Arnold was in a real bad situation, he would just be like, get to the chopper, and then he would fly away from whatever the problem is. I mean, that's the only thing. I bet if he says get to the chopper, a chopper appears. I mean, the man owns a tank. You know what I mean? Um, shoot. I, you know, I think that's pretty fair. I'm trying to see what our kid situation is. 
Wait, can we look at net worths? Let's just take a second to oh, browse net, net worths. Okay. I'm Jean Claude Van Damme, so I'm just gonna finish it off with net worth here. Okay. okay. I'll so what he wants to hit Arnie. Jeez. Well, I have oh, I have that Arnie. Is the second. Yeah. I have Arnie at four hundred million. <laughs> yeah. Also, net. Literally, like that's ten times more than what John Claude Van Damme oh. is like worth. That's crazy. Yeah, because you also got to think that John Claude Van Damme is only around because of Arnold Schwarzenegger, probably. He was like, man, how many more guys can we get to be action stars who don't speak English very well? Oh, wh- who's this JCVD kid? And then they got him. Like, man, this kid can do the splits. <laughs> you see this guy's dance moves? <laughs> get him in oh, blood sport. I have to admit, I had no idea that Arnie was so rich. Muscular? Oh, rich. Yeah, yeah. Just so rich. I didn't know he was so muscular. He really hides it under his shirt most of the time. But Dude, man, he is like the pinnacle of feet. he almost uh, looks like a bodybuilder or something wow <laughs> yeah it's for a roll for a roll it's for jingle all the way he really bulked up <laughs> <laughs> all right so are we down to give it to arnold then i mean that's pretty that's pretty convincing i would say no to uh jean-claude van damme oh yeah oh. it's who's got more debt frank see that's how One you that's those- how- so you get good results on standardized testing. You got to make yeah. sure you read that question. Fine you print. The question. You got to watch out for positive negatives. Who's more likely to have a heart attack? This is kind of dark. This is a dark. I would debate. say John Claude Van Damme, because oh. maybe he realizes how much he's not making, and maybe that spirals into like this reciprocating, you know just thought process of depression because he'll never be Arnold Schwarzenegger or Arnold Schwarzenegger rich, therefore making him have to eat less quality food. And then his uh, cocaine habit on top of all that. And his cocaine and his stress. Just oh, some numbers we got to talk about that are very important. Uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger's 72. Jean-Claude Van Damme's only 59. Mm. Oh, interesting. Oh, you know what? I was joking about the cocaine thing though, but apparently... He has a history of being a drug fueled mess, is how it's coked, coked out of his mind, Jean Claude Van Damme. Um, but this is this is during Street Fighter. He's changed his ways. You know what? I gotta go with JCVD then. I mean, he's got twenty years on the guy. They're both in great physical shape. Although I bet Arnold took way more performance enhancing drugs, things that could have potentially messed with his system, than Jean Claude Van Damme. He's just a fighter, whereas Arnold was really getting into the to the pump. You know wow. what I mean? The pumping. The, the pump. You have to pump it up. So I so are we saying that Arnie is at a Yeah, that's what David was trying to say. He got higher a higher risk. I think Arnold's okay. at a higher risk for a heart attack. I mean he is older and he did take performance enhancing drugs, I'm sure. And John Claude's five ten, Arnold Arnold's six two. See, and that's like a bigger that's the same size heart pump trying to pump to a bigger body, man. <laughs> oh shoot. <laughs> That's I just didn't. science. That's how. That's why, like, giant <laughs> are <die> so young. <laughs> wow. Science checks out. Science no checks out. Well, I guess we have JCVD being our winner, which means he's got to go up against a new challenger. And by new challenger, I mean the challenger from old, last week. No, they, they're both JCVD, aren't they? Yeah, JCVD has the most debt. Oh, wait. Oh, no, no because, yeah. dang, again, Frank gets These us with the standardized negatives. testing. Yeah. <laughs> Just start listening. You read it, David. You're who's, reading questions. Who's most unlikely to not <laughs> perform well <laughs> under I'm sorry. Okay, final question. Man, I was so excited to, to get on to the final round. Here we go. <laughs> Who was more likely to have voted in the first season of American Idol? Now it gets into some interesting philosophical debates. <laughs> what we're really wait, I'm sorry. Who's more likely to vote in? So who, oh. who, who back in 98 or whatever was super into American Idol to the point where they were like, I need to call in and cast my vote <laughs> and make sure my vote counts for American Idol. So what we're really asking is which of these two immigrants who have become a huge part of American culture is the most American? <laughs> I okay. will argue that Arnie was the governor of California, the state in which American Idol took place and was filmed. Dang. 
So he probably was more likely to watch it. 2003. You know what? I also just found out that that Arnie was a judge on the X Factor with Simon, like another Simon Cowell show. Oh, man. He already likes reality uh, talent shows. Um, while we're looking this up, Idol, the first season was in 2002, and 2003 is when he got elected governor of California. Whoa! So maybe he had to really pretty close. He was pumped. He was pumped about California. Say this. Arnold Schwarzenegger last year is making his as of last year is making his rapping debut in a new song about pursuing your dreams. Oh my so- god. That sounds really bad. <laughs> That's the worst thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> but he is a, a fan of music. Hmm. You know what? And I Googled John Claude Van Damme American Idol just to see if there's anything we missed. Not a single result. <laughs> That's relative. Yeah, I, I gotta say, I think the most uh I think I think this really makes the most sense for Arnold. So when American Idol came out, did any of you guys ever vote? for american Idol. yeah i did i did too uh, yeah yeah for sure i did i'm pretty sure i voted for justin like in the finale i don't remember I definitely voted for kelly no i voted for justin because we had similar hair flair <laughs> <laughs> he looks like me um i don't remember who i voted for i just remember calling in that phone number um like how during weird time on the screen you know what i mean like oh, i have to hurry i have to get it in right now what a weird time man what a bizarro time how crazy that they had a call center that was just like i'm sorry did you say nelly there is no contestant named nelly larkson on it. oh kelly i'm sorry well i feel like you had to call different numbers or maybe i'm not remembering that correctly yeah Your i think so that's phone menu type deal yeah, it was something like it was like that. a movie phone <laughs> movie phone yeah movie phone quick write down the times <laughs> oh just to detract from this really quick <laughs> raven and i were watching an episode of seinfeld the other day and we, it was the it was the pick i don't know if you guys watch seinfeld you guys watch no. seinfeld though? okay mm-hmm. so it was the, the one where they're in they're waiting in line for the movie for pretty much the entire episode yes. yeah and just just thinking about living in that time period where you actually had to be at the theater again i remember these days right where yeah. we would drop someone off at the theater so like the one person that has to go buy the tickets for the rest of us and then someone has to go wait in line for all of us to oh, yeah. it, it's like oh man how a cell phone would have solved every problem in this episode <laughs> that's what i was thinking of when i watched that episode too that is a great seinfeld episode man that's a classic yeah, that is an awesome one okay back on it okay well i think we're settled on arnold yeah would be the man to vote for american idol which means that now as arnold is our champ we're going to be moving on where we have arnie face against last week's reigning champ, Scott Pilgrim. Mm. I and, hope it's a physical fight. <laughs> well, I mean, Scott Pilgrim is the greatest fighter in Canada. Um, what we have here is who could win the Nathan's Hot Dog Eating Contest? How much more American can we get in a competition where neither person is American? <laughs> Dang. That's the most American thing I can think of. Yeah, for real. So. <laughs> Straight up. Uh, hmm. I, I would just have to say, I think Arnie could out eat all of us. Yeah. Yeah. Also, the work intake has to be insane. Yeah. And I also got to think like, man, there is just something about Arnold Schwarzenegger where you know that his will and drive for competition is going to be so much greater than the average person. Like you don't get to that level without being like fearless and just driven. <laughs> and I don't think Michael Sarah's got it in him. I'm sorry. I don't think Mr. Universe for like stumbling through things. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> if anything, I I'm do, pretty sure. Sh- oh, sorry. I was going to say, I, I'm pretty sure he could even just walk up to the, the Nathan's hot dog, like bench and look at Michael Sarah and intimidate him into not even eating one hot dog. For reals. Cause he would be eating one and then smashing two with his fists <laughs> and those would disappear. There wouldn't even be anything left. So it's pretty incredible rhythm once you see it. Michael Sarah just walks away with a sad jazz from uh, a of development. <laughs> I love that. It's a great meme too. Um, well, here we are, everyone, at another end of an episode. We've quested, we've interesting, and, and we've peeps and predict. And here we are. And now Arnold is the governor of this podcast, for now at least. 
I'm fine with it. Long may he reign. Yeah, I'll I really allow it. I'm, I've, I'm more comfortable with this muscled man versus the, uh, the fictitious one. Like really lame riding, runs around in like black all the time. Keanu Reeves? Who are you talking about? I'm talking about the Batman. Oh. Um, all that. Well, we all. Every time we do peeps and predicts, peeps and predicts, how happy I am not have to talk about Batman anymore. Well, I mean, we do know that Arnold has already lost to Batman. That is part of his story. <laughs> so there is that. It's true. <laughs> Uh, well, and everything comes back full circle. It does. It always comes back around. And as we come to the end of another episode, thank you for checking it out. Please us- be sure to subscribe. Yeah, I mean, what more can I say? Subscribe. It really helps us out, and it takes two seconds. <laughs> See you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Baby, bye-bye-bye.